Hello everyone, welcome to Field Notes, an exploration of functional medicine. I'm Rob Downey, a family practice MD and Institute for Functional Medicine certified practitioner. I'm coming to you from Seaworthy Functional Medicine in Homer, Alaska. Seaworthy exists to help people overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. We are fortunate enough to have Misty Williams with us today from Healing Rosie. And I'll try to welcome and thank you for being here. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So I'll try to summarize your bio, but please add to, please add to it if I don't uh, have everything there, have it right, or there's more that our listeners will want to know. So you had some real challenges on your health and healing journey. Yeah. And sounds like some of it was very intense. And like a lot of functional medicine patients, it took a while to find the sort of idea operating system that would move you forward. Mm -hmm. And now that's your work is to organize and get these resources out to everybody that needs it. But a lot of the folks that you help are women in a certain age range with brain fog, fatigue, hormonal issues, difficulty yeah. sleeping, wondering mm -hmm. why the why they're not lean even though they're doing the right sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That's right. And also a big focus on sleep, which I think we'll want to flag today because probably the coronavirus pandemic is hacking a fair number of people's ability to do that, even if they're even if they're trying really hard. So mm -hmm. did I miss anything important in your bio, Misty? You know, I think you summed it up pretty well. I am, I'm not a practitioner. I think that's important to note. I really come at my work from the perspective of what's it like to be a patient who's navigating this system. Um, one of the harsh lessons early on for me was there, there isn't a doctor or practitioner who cares more about my health and my healing journey than I do. And unfortunately, I haven't found a practitioner um, up to now. It's been 10 years who has really owned everything about my journey. And, you know, while now I'm fortunate that I work with caring doctors, um, it's really my own advocacy that's helped me get the majority of the results that I've, that I've gotten. And I think that's a really important note, especially for women. We go to doctors and we're told that our labs are normal and things are fine when we complain about our symptoms. Doctors give us antidepressants and basically insinuate that we're making things up in our head or maybe we're just depressed and you know inside we know there's something more going on and i think there's a really empowered perspective that we can take on this journey if we'll just kind of open our mind to it a little bit lower our expectation of doctors i think that's a very fair thing even for wonderful functional medicine doctors <laughs> uh, lowering that expectation that a doctor is going to fix everything wrong with you. I mean, really, we've, if we didn't have toxic lifestyles, we wouldn't be experiencing the symptoms that we're experiencing. So this is kind of a big conversation, this whole healing conversation. And I'm super passionate about helping women to advocate for themselves and to take on this journey so that they can move the needle, shine a light on protocols and, mm -hmm. and practitioners who uh, have really honed in important parts um, of this healing conversation and give people tools so that they can advocate for themselves and uh, make some progress um, does, regardless of who you're working with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thanks for what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, it's very rewarding work, you know. It's very rewarding. I beat my head against a wall for probably a good five years of my journey. And, and I felt very alone, very alone. And my personality is, you could probably even feel in my energy now, I'm, um, I'm vocal, I'm proactive, I take a lot of responsibility, and, uh, and I approached my journey with that the first five years, and I wish I could say that it helped. <laughs> it did not. It did not. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, you know, resilience helped because mm -hmm. eventually I started finding things that worked, and that's, that's what I want to share with people is especially women, you know, it's extra hard, I think, for women in the 21st century, especially in the Western world. We, mm -hmm. women are the perpetuators of the species. Our biology is way more sensitive to our environment than a man's biology is. We're so much more affected by toxicity than men are. And, and, uh, and that delicate balance hormonally that keeps us vital and alive and, you know, rejuvenated mm -hmm. and contributing to the world 
uh, can very easily get knocked off. And then there's just devastating consequences for that. And even in functional medicine, my experience has been that not enough doctors are educated on the hormonal side of helping women heal. And they try to take their protocols and, you know, carte blanche apply them to women without addressing the underlying hormonal issues that are keeping them from sleeping at night mm -hmm. and, um, and further impairing their body's ability to detoxify and everything else. So, you know, it doesn't work as well for women as it does for men. Oh my God, if I had a dollar for every time I've heard that. Yeah, these things don't work as well for men and women. Okay, well, can we open that conversation up? So, <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, hopefully that's part of what we're doing today. Yeah. I'm glad as I hear you talk that women in my practice report feeling heard and they report moving forward. And one thing I can acknowledge, I think with what I hope is a lot of humility is that I think for, I'll, I'm always really careful to only speak for myself and my own MD functional medicine journey, but the, the obvious no-no for MDs is the, the doctor who goes into a delivery room and the woman's delivering a baby and then the male doctor presuming they know what it's like to have the discomfort of giving childbirth, right? Mm -hmm. So sort of overt, overtly patronizing part is so obviously uh, problematic that a lot of thoughtful physicians can maneuver past that predisposition pretty quickly. I think some of the more subtle, insidious aspects may be take longer in practice in terms of hearing women properly. And another thing that really struck me as I started this part of my journey in terms of getting to talk with thought leaders like you and expand out my work around the state of Alaska was that I was really struck by this idea in the Malcolm Gladwell book where he says that after we've done something for 10,000 hours, we start having these aha moments. And I, it hadn't occurred to me that I'd hit about 15,000 15, hours of functional medicine, but he says it's true in like music, software programming, et cetera. And I noticed that a lot of what was happening for me was just going into a state of really deep listening and attending. And, and so then when my female patients were saying, this is how it feels like to be me and this is the stuck point, I was able to really look in a very kind of lucid way, like harmonize with the woman's suffering and clip it to a part of the MD toolbox. And I found I had to go back and listen to a lot of the Institute for Functional Medicine female educators and the ones who had this super nuanced understanding of like, here's the best tools in the toolbox and then keep listening really, really carefully to like, is this getting you what you want? And so, I want to honor what you're saying, and I think it's so important. I, I would say for men and women both, if they're not heard and respected in a deeply humane, attuned way right out of the gate, the, the therapeutic alliance is just botched. Yeah, I, I agree I with that. that. I think there's extra dimensions given the, the multidimensional uh, uh, suffering of, of women um, that just... For me, I don't know where to start with it, except from a place of real humility and honoring. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's very helpful for a doctor in general to, to listen um, and then to accept what a woman is saying. Some of the things that I heard early on were, well, your labs are normal. Like it was an immediate dismissal. Well, your labs are normal. Like, or I'm talking and they're shaking their head. No, <laughs> you know, like you could just tell, you know, coming out of the gate that, that, they're not interested in really hearing and understanding your experience. But you know, one of the things that I think is super important for anyone navigating this journey is to really find the seat of your power in it mm -hmm. and to kind of realign your expectations of working with doctors. Because if you're going into an office and your expectation is this doctor or practitioner um, is supposed to have all the answers and they need to know how to fix me and it's their job to fix me. You're really setting the relationship up for disappointment mm -hmm. because while the wonderful, I mean, I know some pretty Jedi practitioners at this point in my journey, um, as Jedi as they are, they don't have tools that overcome your lifestyle. Um, you know, if you're, if you're not exercising discipline around your sleep, for example, and 
um, and you're not following doctor's orders and you're still frustrated at, about the symptoms that you're dealing with in your life, you know, that doctor really is not, isn't enough of a miracle worker that he, he or she is going to be able to overcome those lifestyle choices that you're making. Or if you're putting yourself in really stressful situations, if you're, if you're in a bad marriage, for example, and so you're, you're stressed out and you're always fighting with your partner and yet you're not making some kind of movement in, in a direction toward peace, you know, whatever that looks like. And, and you keep yourself in that situation. Like, I mean, how is a doctor really going to overcome the enormous amount of stress that you're under? So in general for patients, um, rethinking what we are expecting of our doctor serves that doctor patient relationship really well. You know, I look at, I look at doctors as partners, mm -hmm. you know, and as partners, it's, it's a fairly level playing field. You know, it's that whole Buddhist hold no head above thine own. I, I live by that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're enrolling that doctor as a partner, there's assumed responsibility on both sides. And you're also putting yourself in a position where advocating for your own best interest is your job. You know, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it means you're going to have a hard conversation with the doctor, even if it means, you know, potentially creating discomfort because of, you know, you're going to meet resistance, you know, whatever your story is about it. Um, approaching doctors from a partnership perspective very much serves the healing journey in my own experience. And I see it in our community too. Mm -hmm. So while it's true that doctors who listen can lay an amazing foundation for camaraderie and healing, I also think that it's on us as patients to come to the relationship a little more realistically. Because the truth is now I could go work with, I don't, I don't really believe in having just one doctor. I think there's so many areas of specialization, even within functional medicine, that oftentimes we need a few different people to help us on our journey, depending on the dimension that we're tackling. We're all so unique. Um, so, you know, I could be having a conversation with a doctor, and this actually happened to me. I had a conversation with a practitioner who was helping me with some deep root cause stuff that was affecting my energy. It was like, I just, I was exhausted. I, I was sleeping, but it's, I didn't, I wasn't feeling refreshed. Um, and it, things were perpetual. I was on hormone therapy at this time. This was a few years ago. And I was, I had done some things that had kind of uh, gave me a better foundation, but it was, I just felt like I should be moving uh, further in my journey. And I worked with a practitioner who's very Jedi at this energetic mitochondrial stuff. He was very, very good. And he wanted me to come off hormone therapy. And I didn't want to come off hormone therapy. Like my, I'm sleeping at night because of hormone therapy. You know, I I'm thinking clearly because of hormone therapy. I, I notice a difference in my energy with hormone therapy. So for me to come off would mean that I'm really threatening my ability to provide for myself. Like how do I function in a professional capacity if, you know, if I'm, if I'm just wasted all the time. And so whenever he resisted hormone therapy, I very respectfully explained why it was very important to me and I didn't want to come off. And he came back with, you know, I hear what you're saying and I respect where you're coming from and all right, you stay on it and then we'll deal with this later in the journey. And, you know, it didn't matter to me really in that moment that he wasn't bought in, you know? Uh, it didn't hurt our relationship in the least because I wasn't expecting him. I wasn't, I wasn't looking to him to be my parent, to tell me what to do and that I would have to please him. I was looking to him to be a partner with yeah. me, you know? And so yeah. I think, I think considering the dynamic that we're creating with our, our practitioners and showing up differently really serves the entire relationship. And, you know, even if someone doesn't fully understand or get what you're experiencing, you can still get a lot of value out of that relationship if your expectation isn't that they have to see me and agree with me and, you know, want to do this the same way that I want to do it a hundred percent, you know. I love what you're saying. And I think it might be the most important thing that we talk about today. So I'd actually like to explore it a little further and add or highlight a couple of things for our, our listeners. And so one thing that I flashed on while you were talking is I was thinking about how my relationship with my dad evolved because that mention of relating to our medical providers as parents, I think is a trap. And I would kind of contrast that with the way we relate to a trusted friend. And so for me, I sort of cast my dad as this superhuman when I was young. Yeah. And then 
I was disappointed when the superhero cape wasn't holding up, but it wasn't an expectation that made sense in the first place beyond adolescence. And then it really set the state for these incredibly rich dynamics when he helped me adult to adult. And part of what really fascinated me about that is I deeply respected his opinion and very thoughtfully considered whether or not to act on things that he valued or he shared with me. But I also was capable of saying, that's not me, or that particular right. thing isn't my, isn't my thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that whether it's a, a patient out there or a person or a medical provider, if, if it's not the old school sort of parent-child relationship, which a lot of us intuitively sense is, is flawed for patients having the locus of power within them, particularly women, then, then the question is, well, can the new model of, of equals working together, is there a trap in that? And I don't think there is when there's respect. And I think the, that's the important part, right? It, is, yeah. Is so, well, it, it creates then, it creates a chance for what you described, for the person to say, I, I feel really strongly this is important to me. I'm going to keep doing that. That's on the table. And the provider can say, these are my reservations about it. And at any point, anybody can say the relationship's good. Let's keep the relationship. Let's keep modular aspects of it and have multiple team members. Let's respectfully go different directions because something might be a deal breaker. The patient or the medical provider could feel like they can't move forward anymore because they're too anxious about aspects of one another's plan. It's very transparent. It's very honest. Mm -hmm. And it's the real ease to it when the respect is there. Yeah. And, you know, it's nice when the respect goes both ways. Um, I cert I personally wouldn't stay with a practitioner that I didn't feel respected me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily have to feel they fully got everything about my journey if I felt like they still had some value to bring to, mm -hmm. to my journey, you know. But, you know, if there's not a, a feeling of respect, I think that's mm -hmm. super important. You know, I, there was one time I was working with someone who, this was in 2017. I was having issues with weight gain. I had not had any challenges around weight for a few years. And suddenly I was having weight issues and I'm just like, what's going on? And I hadn't, I hadn't run my labs in probably a year. And paths crossed with this practitioner who, uh, alternative health practitioner, and he had this protocol for cleansing and detoxing that he um, wanted me to do. And I was like, I'm, I can try this. I was tried out his protocol and was on it for a while. And it just got to the point where it was like, oh, this isn't really moving the needle for me. And in my conversations with him, it was kind of a turnaround game of like, you know, you're not, you're not following it enough. There's something you're not doing very shaming, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, this isn't, this isn't working because of, of you and, you know, you have hidden addictions and just a bunch of crap. So uh, this far into my journey, I was very quick to just, you know, cut the string. Like, that's your opinion. I respectfully disagree with you. And because mm -hmm. of, because of the way that you're approaching this, we, our relationship is done, you mm -hmm. know? And I, I think that women especially need to be quicker to do that. If you're working with someone who's sitting in judgment of you, um, mm -hmm. who doesn't feel aligned with your goals and is, and instead of, you know, partnering with you is, is attempting to just make you wrong. You can feel it in your gut, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's very important that you make a pivot. But what we have to be careful of is sometimes, you know, early in our journey, we work with practitioners who we just don't feel like are for us. And I could tell so many stories of that and, and people would be like, oh my God, what has she been through? And others would be like, oh my God, that's been my story too, you know? But really at the end of the day, if I get stuck in my story of, practitioners aren't for me, doctors aren't for me, that even when I find someone who is for me, I'm, I'm playing this old pattern that keeps us from being able to work well together, you know? Go ahead. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's the other thread that I wanted to pick up and I was thinking about one, one thing that'll happen for me is I'm a family practice MD and then I'm IFM certified, so I'm wearing both hats at the same time, but my first training was in the conventional medical system and so a lot of the things that I did early was taking care of people in the hospital or starting medications for mood disorders or treating pneumonia with antibiotics. And, and so I've developed a lot of compassion for, for myself, I guess. My, my first rotation as a third-year medical student 
was I received this message, like, if you don't get these ideas, you're going to kill somebody. So I was very wedded to the ideas. Mm -hmm. And then, and then later I, I sort of, I sort of realized I was breaking people outside of myself, whether it was faculty or educators or people I related to really anyone and everyone into these kind of, um, you know, black and white terms, like what's good and what's bad. And that thread you mentioned was that I, I guess I can relate to so strongly is that in my own relationships with my own providers, I think I'm doing what you're describing, which is this person's another human being with good and bad aspects, with flaws, insights, et cetera. The foundation of the relationship is respect. I need to trust my gut. I need to listen to what I'm, I need to listen to my intuition. And then it also felt like now that this is on me, which is kind of intimidating, but anxiety producing, but also exhilarating, like this is mm -hmm. mine. This is my journey. I'm going to decide yeah. what this means, what makes sense and act on the parts that, and I've had to do a lot of that myself. I, I find then that it's kind of, I love the feeling then when I get to work with patients of resonating, when we figure out, well, how far can we run and how many yeah. things can we do? And, and gender aside, just all of the patients that I feel I have a therapeutic alliance with, I love it when they're going, oh my gosh, my thyroid numbers are good. And now I got this crown back and I want to go after my adrenals and now I'm sleeping better. And suddenly I can run again and I can even do my yoga again. And uh, oh my gosh, now I'm really seeing why the meditation helps the sleep and just boom, 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 the dominoes start falling. And I, I just love it when we get wind in our sails and we're really rolling. Yeah. And I don't feel like it's not my ego agenda how far we run, but they're digging it and they are feeling well supported. And so it's just a natural momentum, not that we're trying to make it happen. Yeah. And that's what I wish for everyone. I wish for every single person to find doctors and practitioners to align with them on their journey that they feel supported by, that they feel are for them, that are for their healing. You know, we really need that. Even though at this stage of my journey, you know, it's like, I almost feel like the doctor's there to run the labs and to make sure that I'm not getting too crazy with the stuff I'm trying, you know? <laughs> um, it's, it's not like, like it was a couple years ago when my situation was more dire and I was, you know, so, so desperate for help, but finding, finding those relationships, um, it's deeply transformative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's so many creative ways that people can create those relationships with doctors and, and build their medical teams. You know, sometimes there's kind of this belief that, oh my gosh, functional medicine is so expensive. And if you don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to spend um, on a functional medicine doctor and lab work, then, you know, like why even bother? Like I'm just destined to, you know, suffer with my symptoms forever. And what I've found is that it's really unbelievable how the universe conspires on your behalf when you commit to resourcefulness and figuring things out. And, you know, there's ways to navigate all of this. There's ways to navigate the health insurance piece. And, you know, I've I'm fortunate that I've, I've got it set up so that most of my doctor visits and my labs are paid by my insurance, but I still have out of pocket stuff. I just stroked a check for $600 to do the Dutch test and, you know, mm -hmm. a few other things like that. So, um, all of us have to figure out how to make this happen. And if you're committed and you're open hearted, um, you can do it. You can find a way and you can find practitioners who are for you, who are on your team who want the best for you mm -hmm. and together you can really make progress in your healing journey. And, you know, that's really why the whole, the healing Rosie community exists is to provide a place for us to all come together and support each other and ask questions and get encouragement and figure out what's working and, you know, lift those boats together. Great. Well, let me, add for our listeners then to a couple of the pieces of wisdom you shared. One is in the early going, you said that that functional medicine patients have skin in the game. And I just want to emphasize that. So sleep, movement, social connection, whole food, stress management. Those are the, the tools that can move people forward. A lot of which don't cost money. They cost time and insight. So, mm -hmm. so I love it that you said that. And then, 
what you were, you know, just sharing recently, the way I, you articulated that, I just think that's a really powerful message for for people. And so I'm glad again that listeners to this can can hear that. I want to make sure and segue into some laser targeted things that were of interest uh, that I presume would be of interest to our listeners today. One is that uh, just you've already shared that people can connect this community, women in particular, if this community has a value to them and the show notes will have ways for them to, to click on that and find you. And when I went to find you, it was very easy to get to healinggoatrosie.com and see there's lots of avenues in. So I don't think anybody will have trouble with that part, but on sleep, let's talk about two dimensions. A now with your concern about the importance of sleep, You've probably got some expertise you can share with people how they can get back on track to sleep when they're highly stressed. Yeah. Secondly, you've got a sleep summit, which might be an additional tier of resources people want to access. So would you share some things about those two things with us? Yeah. Well, you know, sleep is, my gosh, I'm trying to think if there's anything in life I love more. (laughs) (laughs) I just love of sleeping and I love I love going to bed. I love being in the bed. I love waking up in the bed in the morning. Like just everything about sleeping. I mean, I, I feel like my energy and my vitality um, and my joy all comes from getting a really great night's sleep. And I've had a lot of sleep struggles. So I know what it's like to not have that. Um, I actually went to 144 hours without sleep at the very beginning of my health journey when they stitched up part of my small intestines on the way out of a surgery. Not a distinction one would ever hope for. Uh, yes, yes. So I went six days, not able to keep down food or water. We had a follow-up surgery to fix it, and then I didn't sleep for six days. So uh, lots of trauma in my life around sleep, and so I, I extra value it. But I started noticing patterns, you know, where um, I'd be trying different protocols and stuff, and it's like this pro- protocol is supposed to take you 10 miles. And for me, I went like two blocks in the given amount of time. Like, why isn't this working for me? Like I've had that feeling of, I'm, am I broken? Like why, what is so different about my biology that I can't, I can't get, you know, whatever the expected return on, um, on this protocol is. And, you know, everything always goes back to sleep. And when you are dealing with health challenges, it's not uncommon for you to struggle with sleep have trouble falling asleep at night or have trouble staying asleep through the night. And as we get older, the sleep challenges can become even more compounded. Um, I can tell you that men and women both struggle with sleep. Um, A big, big thing for men is, um, is prostate health really affects their sleep at night. And I've heard from a lot of men post summit actually, that that's been a big issue for them as they've gotten older. And of course, stress can really affect sleep for men, um, for women, um, our hormones declining as we're getting older has a severe impact on our sleep. And women are way more affected by declining hormones than men are. And in fact, I have yet to come across a man, and I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I haven't come across a man who has used hormone therapy and it's improved his sleep, you know? So I just think women are wired a little differently on that front. And of course, I had mercury poisoning in 2013, where they improperly drilled mercury from my teeth, which crashed all my hormones. Um, I was diagnosed with premature ovarian failure at 38 years old. And um, no one asked any questions about uh, dental work. So we didn't connect the dots till five years later. I connected them myself actually and realized, oh, I had mercury fillings and those were not drilled out properly as I started getting educated on oral health, you know? So my declining hormones had a massive impact on my sleep. And so I've tried so many different protocols for sleep. And um, for me, if, I can, if my hormones are optimized, I'm sleeping great. And so lots of women are dealing with that as we get older. And there's a, there's a, lot, of, um, there's a lot of habits and hygiene that affect our ability to sleep well. You know, a big one that we need to all acknowledge just in general, kind of as a foundational principle of sleep is that our entire body is governed by circadian rhythms. Like everything in our body has a circadian component to it. Um, The timing in the body for different activities to happen, cellular response, everything has a circadian piece. And basically what circadian is, is light. And it means that our bodies are governed by light cycles. So 
You know, we wake up in the morning, first thing, light hits our eyes, something in our brain resets that says, all right, it's daytime. And our brain kind of knows at this time of year, this is how long the daylight is. And then evening comes and the sun goes down and, you know, back in our caveman days, sun goes down means it's dark and our body is no longer taking in light. And so that sends a whole different set of messages through the body and we move into parasympathetic activity. It's time to sleep. This is when our bodies repair, restore, heal. You know, this all happens at night. And there's just this rhythm of, you know, you go through your activities during the day, everything shuts down at night, repair, restore, heal, sleep, wake up the next day, restored, ready to go again. And so when this cycle becomes disrupted, there is a tremendous price paid by the body. And I think that alone has done more to shift my relationship to sleep than anything else. Just that awareness that we're not just sleeping. There is actually a biological function that's tied to light that's affecting the health of our bodies. So I started in 2013 when, or 2012 when I learned about all of this. Uh, I learned back in those days from Ben Greenfield and Dave Asprey and had found the paleo movement and ancestral health and was really trying to understand from a lifestyle perspective what I needed to do to get my lifestyle in check. So I was more aligned with my own biology and I started wearing amber glasses back then, which you could only get the ones that looked like safety goggles. <laughs> they were not sexy. And Speaking of paying a price for yourself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I had a friend come over one night at about 8.30 and he called them birth control because they, they just looked obnoxious. But I was very committed at this point. I was having so many challenges that it was like, I, this is not going to be the thing that derails my life, you know? So so now you can go to Amazon and you can find amber glasses for 15 bucks, 20 bucks, 30 bucks. And there's so many different brands out there with different styles and you can get them prescription and everything else. So you don't have to make the incredible social sacrifices that I made in 2012 to honor my circadian biology. Um, but that was a really foundational thing that I did and it made a huge difference. So basically when it, when the sun goes down, you put the amber glasses on and that filters out the blue light that's telling your body that it's daytime. So you've got two sets of sensors in the body. I might be oversimplifying this just a little bit. This will help everyone understand. You have the SDN, which is right behind the eye. That is your body's master clock. Um, and then of course you have all these clocks in your organs and everything else too that respond to the SDN. And then you also have sensors in your skin. It's actually in the red blood cells that are traveling through your skin that uh, pick up on the blue light. And when the blue light is sensed, then melatonin production is reduced. And when there is no blue light, uh, mel melatonin production grows. And so that alone can really help someone get on the right track. Just the knowledge of that framework, putting those amber glasses on, dimming the lights in your house. In my house, I have amber bulbs and many of, not all my lamps, but lots of my lamps. We do no overhead lighting. Everyone wears amber glasses and it helps it. My brain is ready to go to bed when it's supposed to go to bed. And I've shared this tip with so many people. I have not had a single soul in eight years or so of sharing this. that's come back and been like, man, that thing didn't work for me. Everybody notices improvements when you start honoring um, that part of sleep, you know, just the need to get, filter out that blue light so your body can actually shut down and transition into sleep. And of course there's, tons about sleep hygiene that you can find all over the web if you really want to geek out on this stuff um, that can help you with sleep. But we all need to kind of honor that three-hour period before bed. We need to stop eating. We need to, um, it's, it's not the time to do your bills. It's not the time to have a fight with your partner. It's not the time to have the evening news on that's going to get you all ramped up. You know, we need to, we need to give ourselves time to slow down. And that's really hard in our Western lifestyles. We want to go, 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 and then drop into bed and go to sleep. <laughs> and we're finding that that's actually not realistic and not working. Um, so, you know, some of, it's, some of this is just lifestyle management. Like, what are we doing to honor how we're wired? I just finished a, um, a, a session today, a few hours ago, with a, a group of students going through the Best Sleep Master Course, which was the follow-up to Your Best Sleep Ever, the summit that I just did and they're asking questions about shift work you know what do you do when you have shift work and you're working half the night and it's like man i wish i've talked to so many really amazing doctors and practitioners about this and you know what they all say 
like all of them, they all say you have to stop. <laughs> That's the answer. And it's, there's so much resistance to that, especially because I know a lot of times shift work means you're getting higher pay. And what do you do for first responders and firefighters and people, you know, who are just in these lifestyles where you're going to have sleep disruption at night and there's just no getting around the incredible toll that that that's going to take on your health long term. So fundamentally, yeah. if we think about what sleep actually is and from a circadian perspective, how sleep works, you know, with the circadian rhythms in the body, we can a lot of times find plenty of things in our lifestyle to tweak to start supporting better sleep. Mm -hmm. Great. Boy, a ton of great content there. And I think the theme is that those of us who use functional medicine for ourselves and then we're sharing it with others, we're honoring really their ancient rhythms. I mean, they're as old as the planet. We're really yeah. up with, with Mother Earth, which is part of honoring the feminine too. And and it can we can sort of like dig in against that almost in a kind of rebellious teen kind of way. <laughs> or we We're going to outsmart it. Technology is going to do it somehow. <laughs> or we can, or we can flow with it. And I find that, that that's, there's an honesty we're sharing with people who want to know what wisdom we have to share when we say this is something that's right in front of you, but it's so right in front of you that the, the way that you cannot see it is in part because in Western culture, we think if it costs $30,000 to find out at Mayo Clinic, we'll get $30,000 worth of value. But if it's free to get a good sleep, then we'll get $0 worth of. Yeah. I think American culture has a little bit of that. And then I think, it can be even be humbling for for any of us, but certainly for me, as I started to get a, a good sleep, which was a big deal for after delivering babies all night and being in the ER all night to switch into the functional medicine part of my career, where one of the privileges, I had never thought of the pun, doctor's privileges, which is normally about what you get to do in the hospital, but the privilege for me as a functional medicine doctor is I get to sleep at night. Right. Because I have to practice what I preach to be an effective provider. Other, otherwise, I'd be like the lung doctor who smokes. I wouldn't be mm -hmm. believable. So I, have, I, I felt like it took six to 12 months of good sleep before I felt like the batteries that were most deeply depleted kind of got recharged. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like, oh my gosh, the robins sound more beautiful this spring. The air feels fresher after the rain. I mean, there was just literally a coming back to life in response to restorative sleep. I had the same. It took me six months. I was a chronic night owl. So I never went to bed before 2 a.m. from 18 to 35. Never, never, ever went to bed before 2 a.m. And, and I loved it like that. And I would just say, I'm a night owl and whatever. And then when I got my surgery, I had an endometriosis diagnosis in there. They removed my left ovary along uh, with a large cyst, found polyps on my uterus and spent two hours removing scar tissue from my abdomen got my attention that, you know, something needed to change. I was hearing from conventional doctors during that time that, um, that my labs were normal and everything was fine as they were doing surgeries and continue to recommend more surgeries, by the way. Um, but that was, I definitely got my attention and I talked to a doctor not long after a chiropractor actually, who, um, his first question to me was tell me about your sleep. And, um, I went from going to bed at 10, no, two, 10 in my dreams, two to going, I w started going to bed between nine and 10 PM. And it took me six months of getting to bed, which where I would start waking up in the morning, not feeling like I'd been hit by a Mack truck. And I was just coming out of this deep stupor, you know, of just e exhaustion, um, six months. So I don't think that's uncommon for people that have chronically had, um, issues around sleep and just not sleeping, you know, and resetting that circadian pattern. It takes a while. I did cold baths too. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with mm -hmm. cold therapy, but I, I was shocked actually how much it helped my sleep about two weeks of doing a cold bath. And it was tap water, essentially about 62 degrees. Uh, I would get in at about 7 PM 
and do it for 30 to 45 minutes. I would hyperventilate for about a minute and then I was fine. It's like a swimming pool, you know, you jump in <laughs> and then it shocks your system at first and then your body adjusts, mm -hmm. but it does take a while. You know, if anyone needs to do that reset, you just have to be patient with your body and just mm -hmm. honor your body and, and reshuffle the priorities in your life. I reshuffled a lot of priorities. I let a lot of things go, spent a lot more time in bed and uh, I was pretty committed at that point that I, I couldn't see my whole life go off the rails at 35 years old. So, uh -huh. yeah. Well, as I hear you share today, I hope that people check out uh, the resources that you provide because clearly there's a huge wealth of knowledge that you have to share and connect folks with. And I think that I should mention too, in terms of being heard that I am both, I feel privileged and sobered at the number of times I get to hear the story, I thought something was going on, but it wasn't until I, I took responsibility to learn more or I found a certain resource or a person who could illuminate it for me. And so I just want to acknowledge that there's a lot of that that you're sharing in your story today. And I think that, I think that takes a lot of courage. And I think, it, I think it helps people who then don't feel as alone on their own journey but I also think it takes courage to put your story out there. Yeah. You know, I think at some point you, I, in, in my experience, cause it was, it's been long, you know, and, and interestingly, I hear from women all the time who've been struggling for 20 years, 30 years. I did a summit a couple of years ago called fix for female hormones. And I had someone message me and she said, this has been my life for 50 years. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, Oh, you know, I just feel heart sick. Mm -hmm for so many women who've lost so many years of their life. And, um, you know, it's, it, I remember in the early days of healing Rosie, feeling a little uncomfortable with how much I'm putting out there, but you know, when you have so many women coming out going, uh, you just told my story, you know, I felt less alone. I, I, it normalized things for me. Like I'm just, I'm talking about something that is so commonplace in our culture. Unfortunately, you know, we're all in this soup together and, and, um, I consider it a real privilege to hold this sacred space and I can feel in the way that you talk about your practice that, that you're doing the same, you know, we have a desire to create space for healing in whatever way our influence and wisdom allows us to do it. And, you know, my prayer is that people find hope if they're not alone and they start getting connected to doctors and healers and protocols and, um, and education that helps them to see their way through it, you know, not right just a, you're not alone, but Hey, here's, here's the way walkie in it, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. here's, here's some things you can do. And it requires more from us. It's a lot easier to believe that we're just going to go to a doctor and they're going to write a prescription, but that's, that isn't, that's not the real world of healing, but we can create it for ourselves and come together. We don't have to do it alone. Right on. Well, you, you've given us a lot of time today. Let's close with something I think will probably be really fun and illuminating. When I was looking at your website, it occurred to me that Rosie the Riveter as a visual icon is sort of a little Easter egg right there on your website. And before we started today, you mentioned that that's kind of the case. So can, do you want to close with that? Yeah, sure. Us? Well, you know, I mean, everyone knows Rosie the Riveter, right? Rosie the Riveter called the women up to work in the factories during World War II while all the men were overseas fighting. And there was a workforce shortage. Um, and that, that campaign was led by the U.S. government. Um, so I've always known of Rosie, you know, as a woman. Um, I've never considered myself a feminist, actually, but I've never been not a feminist um, either because I'm very much for the, the empowerment of women and the politicization of that bothers me a little bit, but you know, I it's it's part of who I am, and I came I came by that really honestly in 1933. Um, my great grandmother, uh, Tina May, lost her husband to double pneumonia. Um, he owned a furrier in downtown Columbus, Ohio. They had six children together, and in those days, when you when a woman lost her husband, uh, the children were all orphaned because a woman can't provide, and so. People in the community came to my great grandmother and said, I'll take Tina May, I'll take Florence, I'll take Carl. And she was flipping out. I mean, first of all, she just lost her husband in a very traumatic way, you know, double pneumonia. It's not like he was sick for six, six months, you know, it was like pretty quick and he was gone. And so she lost her husband 
and now her whole family was going to be split up. So she went to the man who was helping her husband run the business and asked him to stay on. And she took over the family business in 1933 when there was no such thing as female entrepreneurs, when there was no such thing as a single mother. There was no single mothers back then. And she ran the business and she raised six kids alone. And so this is a family story. And our family, I remember being a little girl and we talk about the story like it was no big deal, you know, like, and then, you know, great grandfather Carl died and she raised all the kids and, you know, it was like, okay, let's play blocks. <laughs> you know, it was oh no word. big deal at all. But in around <laughs> 32 for me, when I really started like piecing together the timeline for for women's liberation and historically looking at this unbelievable opportunity I had as a woman to contribute in the workforce and to be an entrepreneur and all these things, started getting this newfound appreciation like, oh my gosh, she was headed headlong into the Great Depression. And she did this, like women in my family are really strong, you know, my, her daughter Florence told me a story once I was 22 years old or so visiting her in Columbus, Ohio. And um, she told me that during the war, and this is really where the Rosie connection comes up for me. Uh, when Rosie was calling all the women up, up to work in the factory, she was one of the first women who went and applied to work. And I can see, she didn't say this at the time, but I'm looking back, like her mother was an entrepreneur. Like she grew up with a woman working. Like it was, it, it did not even occur to her to not sign up. You know, there wasn't the typical social bias that she had to push through to be compelled to want to sign up and make a contribution, you know, and she got a letter from her husband whenever he found out that she was working. He sent her a letter from Germany. He was a fighter pilot and sent a letter from Germany and told her that she was bringing shame on the family, that she needed to stop working immediately, that he, that she was embarrassing him. Uh, by the way, it took three weeks for this letter to get to her from Germany. They brought it by carrier pigeon. I don't know. It took forever. Oh my! And it was it was a it was a really big deal to outsiders that she had answered this call. But for her, she's oh gosh, she's gone now. But she's so Aunt Florence was spunky, full of life, four foot ten, German, like just she'd put you in your place and you'd like it. You know, she'd make you laugh, and she just had so much energy. And I I started thinking in my early 30s about this unbelievable history that I have and this connection to this iconic Rosie the Riveter and what Rosie the Riveter meant in history, what she means for women. But what I'm experiencing is all this stress that we take on as women in the name of empowerment has the potential of really breaking our bodies down. And we have to be really careful about how we align with a lot of systems societal expectations around women doing everything and some of those means because we still need to honor our bodies and our bodies are not designed to deal with stress as well as a man's body as much as I hate that as a woman like there's something inside me that just Rrr. but the truth is the truth is is that men can deal with stress a lot better than women they have the testosterone to be able to counterbalance it they don't have the hormonal needs that women have for all of those hormones, their bodies just aren't as sensitive in general to these outside effects, even the circadian stuff. So, you know, we just have to be mindful of that and honor who we are. And healing Rosie really is about kind of healing that iconic empowered part of us that in some ways is really admirable and strong. And I feel proud as a woman to be aligned with it. And in other ways is, has its own dysfunction and can really be breaking us down. And it's kind of a call to like, let's pay attention and let's make sure that we're healing Rosie. So mm, that's so cool. Yeah. Well, as part of thanking you, then I should share that I've witnessed my daughter recently as part of graduating as a senior in high school. She just tracked the Equal Rights Amendment from its beginnings in the late 1800s at the Seneca Falls Convention in New York to it currently being a vote in the Senate away from uh, you know, adoption. And so that's a, I think it's a 145 year trajectory. Yeah. Really interesting. It's and, fascinating, right? And Rosie the Riveter and those aspects of, of what was happening at time in government are part of that trajectory. So I really flashed on that as you talked today and I really flashed on my daughter and I have some Jedis we've liked. We've always been a fan of Ahsoka and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that whole idea of balance and using the good side of the force. And again, uh, yeah. different, you know, different 
uh, practitioners wielding the blade have to always be aware of their strengths and weaknesses, right? And so mm-hmm. a lot of like uh, female martial artists are, you know, uh, really adept at like Aikido moves and like, you know, circular motions and redirecting energy and super tactical. So that's yeah. kind of a part of what we got to talk about today too. So thank you so much. What a blast. What a privilege. Well, thank you. This has been awesome. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Seaworthy exists for people to overcome their health challenges and be fully vital. Please consider subscribing, giving us a five-star review if we've earned it, and going to our website podcast tab for any questions or comments you'd like to share with us. Thanks.